John chapter number 12, and verse number 15. I've looked at some of the places where the Lord is found sitting. You know the Bible said that uh, Mary was found sitting at His feet. Well, now we're going to find the places where the Lord is sitting. And in John 12 and verse 15, the Bible said, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Father, bless your word now. Your holy word. Amen. You can be seated. You may lose the significance of that if you don't think about what the Old Testament says, that man is born like a wild ass's colt. <clears throat> that means that if you look at the text very carefully, <clears throat> that an ass had to be redeemed. If you didn't redeem it, you'd break its neck because it represents fallen man. It represents man in his fallen nature. And so the Lord Jesus Christ comes triumphantly riding, sitting on man's fallen nature. What that means is he is subduing it. And he can subdue man's fallen nature. It takes that. The Lord's the only one that can do it. Philosophy and psychology can't do it. Religion's failed. But the Lord Jesus Christ never fails. Amen. And it is that nature, that old nature, that, uh, that gives you so much trouble. And the thing is, if you're born again, you still have that old nature. Still have it. The apostle said in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am. Over here in the book of Matthew, chapter number 9 and verse number 10, we read these words. Matthew 9, 10. The scripture says, It came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. This is because he has drawing power. He was sitting there, and the republicans and sinners came to where he was. They still do. They still do. He said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Now, when that publican smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a thief. Did I mess up? What did he say? A sinner. And what he meant by that was, I may steal, I may do this, I may lie, or it may be some other sin, it may be some hidden type of spiritual sin, it may be a sin of omission, it may be anything. But the broad bottom line is, it's not what I've done, Lord, it's what I am. The Apostle Paul said of the sinners, I am the chief. And the reason he said that is because as he grew in grace and knowledge in the Lord, his perception of the sinful nature was sharpened, and he became keener in his understanding of the real nature of sin. Instead of glossing over it, and instead of making excuses for it and categorizing it, and make up your do list and don't list, the apostle realized that in him dwelleth no good thing in his flesh. The flesh includes the fleshly mind. Keep this in mind that your mind has a mind of its own. <laughs> Amen. Think about that. <laughs> it's got a mind of its own, and you've got to bring it into subjection. And so that's why it says to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against, the, against, the, uh, against God. And cast it down. You have to constantly be on the lookout, on the lookout, on, on alert, to keep your thinking faculties lined up correctly. That's where the battle starts. It starts in your mind. And if you pump in a bunch of garbage into your mind, garbage comes out. Garbage in, garbage out. If you fill your days full of uh, TV with blaspheming and all of the filth that goes on with it, then be assured that it's going to come out and it's going to permeate your mind. And it's going to affect you when you try to get out and pray. The devil's going to fire darts at you, and he's going to pull up the stuff into your mind. So how do you do that, preacher? Fill it full of the Word of God. Fill your mind full of Scripture, and then pray. Thy, thy Word have I hid in mine heart. Now, how do you do that? Well, the first thing you do is read it with your mind, with your head, use your brain. But then you begin to meditate on it and take it into your heart. Once you meditate on the Word of God and take it into your heart, you may not be able to memorize Scripture. It's not easy to memorize Scripture. Some folks can memorize chapter and book. And that's good for you. If you can do that, good. But some folks have a harder time memorizing Scripture. But you can take Scripture into your heart and portions of it. You can latch on to it. And you can claim that. 
and let that become part of your life. And quote it throughout the day. Sing yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing make a melody in your heart to the Lord. That will help renew your mind. The book Bible said in Matthew chapter number 24 and verse number 3. Upon the Mount of Olives, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? <clears throat> the end of the world is the end of the age. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is given in general terms in Matthew chapter number 24, things to look for. But the second coming of Christ is what is in view and not the catching away of the bride. The bride is not in Matthew 24. What's in Matthew chapter number 24 directly affects the earth and the Jewish people. He said, what will be the signs of thy coming and of the end of the age? Should we have any reason tonight to look for the coming of the Lord? We have every reason to look for the coming of the Lord. I have every reason to look for the coming of the Lord. And I, I have a reason... <clears throat> I have a reason tonight to look for the coming of the Lord in my lifetime. In my few short years on this earth. I'm here today and I'm gone tomorrow. I'm a vapor that shows up for a little while, then I'm gone. That's all we are in the flesh. But I believe that I live in a generation that's going to lay eyes on the second coming of Christ. And I, can't, I, cannot, I can't emphasize to you tonight what a wondrous thing that will be. To see the heavens open and the Son of God come back. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 55, in that same hour, said Jesus to the multitude, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. Isn't that an amazing thing, how that he opened to them the Scriptures? And when he opened to them the Word of God, they knew they were hearing the Scriptures taught in a way they had never heard it before, that the Bible had come alive. But because of social pressure and because of various reasons, they had joined with the multitude and turned against him. They had turned against the only one who could cast the light on the Word of God like he did. Nobody could do that. And the reason he could is because he wrote the Bible. He sat and he taught. When the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, folks, one of the great ministries that he had was as a teacher. Rabbi means master, teacher. He was a teacher. And what he taught them, they passed on to the disciples who passed on to the disciples who passed on to the disciples. He taught them the Word of God. When he was 12 years old, his parents, you know, Joseph, his earthly father, and his mother had left him in Jerusalem. And they had gone three days' journey. And for three days, he confounded and astounded the doctors of the law with his knowledge of the Bible. And why did he do that? Because he was full of the Holy Spirit of God. You can't be full of the Holy Ghost and not be full of the Word. That's impossibility. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, you're full of the Bible. Otherwise, you're full of emotion. And you can't have it both ways. In John chapter number 4 and verse number 6, Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. <clears throat> the first hour is six o'clock in the morning. The third hour is nine o'clock in the morning. The sixth hour is noon, high noon. So this woman had come in the heat of the day. And the reason she came in the heat of the day has been said so many times is because the other women wouldn't come with her, wouldn't be seen with her. She'd had five husbands. The man she was with wasn't her husband. So they wouldn't be seen with her. She was a disgrace to the Samaritans. And so she had to come on her own, and she had to come in the heat of the day. And if you'll notice, the Bible says, the Lord said to his disciples, I must needs go through Samaria. Now, to go through Samaria... He was traveling from Judea to Galilee. So that meant he was traveling from the south to the north. And that he had to go out of his way to go through Samaria. Because he could have gone right up the Jordan Rift. I've been to the Holy Land enough to know the roads as they lead from one end of the country to the other. The Jordan Rift is where the Jordan River is located. And if he'd left out of Judea and gone right up the Jordan River, he'd gone right into Galilee. 
because the Jordan River flows right out of the Sea of Galilee. All you got to do is follow it, and it'll take you to the Sea of Galilee. But instead, he went out of his way to go into Samaria. And it wasn't for a revival meeting. It wasn't for a big group of people. It was for one soul. Amen. One soul. Now, the soul was real, and the woman was real, and what happened was real. But it was also recorded in the Word of God. And the Lord Jesus knew it would be recorded in the Word of God. John's the one who recorded it. The reason it's recorded in the Scripture, it's recorded for posterity. It's recorded for future generations. It's recorded for you, and it's recorded for me. Here's a woman that had nothing, and yet he sat on the well. He was waiting for her, and when she showed up, there he was. That's the way he confronts sinners. He didn't condemn her. He just let her know that she couldn't have him without, first of all, coming to grips with who she was and the sin that she'd committed. And that's what it's always been about and always will be. You can't have a relationship with the Lord unless you have a right relationship with God based on your understanding of sin as it relates to God and as it relates to you. None of you are perfect. I'm not perfect. Nobody will ever come to the Lord perfect. But when you come to Him, you come to Him in full knowledge that what you have done, if you have done something, that that is confessed. Once it's confessed, it's forgiven immediately. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's where Satan steps in because he loves to take your sin and beat you to death with it and keep dragging it up in your life. That's when you are condemned. That's what's called the condemnation of the devil. So the Bible says that at the well, he met with her. In Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 1, the Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. When the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father, and was glorified, he sent the Holy Spirit. The Bible said in John chapter number 20, and John chapter number 7 rather, that the Lord Jesus Christ says that if you're thirst, let him come unto me, I'll give you to drink, and it shall be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. This spake he, the Bible said, of the Spirit that should be given. But the Spirit was not yet given, the Bible said in John 7, because Jesus was not yet glorified. He had to be glorified. In plain words, the giving of the Holy Spirit of God that's in you as the seal that you're born again is based entirely on the glorification of the Son of God. His finished work, who He is now and who He will be when He comes again. That's how the Holy Spirit comes to you. That's what He's about. He's about, re he's re he's about revealing to you the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. And is He ever glorified? Amen. He's glorified. This woman named her son up there in, in, in Cock County, named him Messiah. And the judge says, well, I'm not going to, you can't do it. So they changed his name or so, whatever it was to Marlin or whatever. It makes no difference. It's irrelevant. But the judge says, there's only one Messiah. <laughs> and he's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the Savior who forgives people of sins. I thought this judge is doing some mighty good preaching. And the news media is reporting it. <laughs> you notice how stuff like that works? They wouldn't put a preacher on there at all. But a judge can preach something like that and get the truth out. So, you know, these people up there are going to pursue it. They're going to push the issue. And, you know, they're going to, they're going to try to, for some whatever reason it is, to, uh, to keep this child with the name Messiah. They're not doing that child any favors. They may be gone tomorrow, but that child will grow up and carry that name. And that child will suffer dearly. You might as well call the child Christ. Messiah is the Hebrew for the Greek Christ, Christos, the anointed of God. Imagine that. That's exactly what they call. There's only one Christ. There's only one Lord God. Just one. And so you get into a situation where you're showing your flesh and you're showing, uh, you're showing corruption when you do that too. I would, I, I would counsel those people, don't fight this. Change that boy's name. Because you're gonna, you've got a lot of sorrow and heartache waiting for you. The judge says that a lot of people up here in Cock County are going to be highly offended when you carry the name of Messiah. It offends me. Does it offend you? Yes, it does. 
So he's at the right hand of the Father. In the book of Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 3, the Scripture says, Who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. This shows that the work is complete, but it also shows that the Lord Jesus Christ is connected with sins. He is the Savior of the sinner. He's the one who forgives your sins. He's the expiation for your sins. He's the remedy for your sins. He's the power over sin. His blood is what cleanses sin. There is no forgiveness with God over sin except through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that sin can destroy, Christ restores. Everything that sin does, the Lord Jesus Christ negates. He turns it. He makes it null and void. He is the absolute absolute answer for sin. Just remember the name of Jesus. Regardless of how sin affects you, what it does to you, how it's gained power in your life, the Lord Jesus Christ is God's remedy for sin. You don't have to know a lot of theology to be forgiven for your sins. All you have to know is Jesus. If you really know the Son of God and cry out to Him and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for this. Help me with this. Give me strength over Give me victory over this sin. This thing eats me up. This thing follows me around. Satan uses it to beat me over the head. It's become a stronghold in my life. I need victory over this sin. Well, don't look to yourself for the victory. Don't look to your ability to overcome it. That builds self-righteousness and arrogance and puts a wall between you and God and also puts blinders on your eyes because a sin will always mask another sin. The only way that you can be forgiven for your sins is to grasp the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can crawl on your hands and your knees and do penance for the next 50 years and will not do away with your sins. But one simple act of faith believing that the Lord Jesus Christ paid the sin debt at the cross and accept what He did for you and base your forgiveness on what He did for you. By faith, your sins are forgiven. You accept that and the burden's lifted. Folks want the burden lifted first so they'll know their sins are forgiven. Take hold of God's Word and His promise that He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And take hold of that, embrace that, receive that into your soul, and your, and your sins will be forgiven and the burden will be lifted. Because you've received by faith the grace of God to do what God said that He'd do as it relates to your sins. Amen. On the right hand of the Majesty on high is where the Lord Jesus Christ is. Matthew chapter 19, verse number 28, the Bible said, And Jesus said to them, Verily I say to you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the uh, church of God, judging the ones who replaced Israel, judging the on postmillennial brethren, judging who? <laughs> That's what he said. Twelve tribes of Israel. You know, I'm going to leave the Bible for what it says and just take it for what it says. What does it say? It says that there are twelve tribes of Israel and that they will be judged. And the twelve tribes of Israel are called out in Revelation 7, Revelation 14. Israel is still an, is, is still an entity with an identity. And they're going to come before God and God's going to deal with Israel as a nation. And the church is not going to take their place. And we're not going to usurp them, push them out. <coughs> the Israel is still Israel. Matthew 25, verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. That's in Jerusalem. That's when He reigns in Jerusalem over the house of Israel, and He reigns with the saints of God, and that's who we are. And we'll reign with Him for a thousand years. And salvation will go out of Jerusalem. Salvation shall go forth from Zion, the Bible says. And Israel will become the head of all the nations. And the Bible said seven men will take hold of the skirt of one Jew and say, We've heard that God's with you. And He is with them. And He will resurrect them. 
the valley of dry bones that Ezekiel looked at when God prophesied through Ezekiel breathed on them and life came to them and they stood up. That's Israel. This is the house of Israel, he said. The whole house of Israel. And when the whole house of Israel is revived, and they are going to be revived. And he said in the book of, Hebrew, in the book of Romans chapter number 11, So all Israel shall be saved. Hath God cast away his people which he foreknew? God forbid. He said, I am an Israelite. The apostle Paul said in Romans chapter number 9, he said, I wish that I should be accursed from God, from my brethren. But uh, he can't be accursed because he's been blessed. He's willing to give himself so that they could be saved. And then God revealed to him his plan for Israel and what the future held for them. So he's going to sit on the throne of his glory. It's not always going to be the way it is right now. The church is going to end... In the, the church age will end faster than anything has ever ended. <laughs> how, how much faster can it be in a moment in the twinkling of an eye? <laughs> That's how fast the church age will end. Just bang. Speed of light. It's over with. And then the focus is upon Israel. And it will take seven years of tribulation to prepare Israel for their Messiah. That's what that seven years is for. It prepares them for the coming of the Mashiach, Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ, the Christ, the Messiah. And seven years is in preparation for him to come. And they believe me. When he shows up, they're going to see him right. eyeball to eyeball. Amen. That's when Israel is going to be saved. Amen. They're not going to be saved through evangelization. Some will be, but most of them won't be. They're not going to be saved through any kind of a movement or any kind of revival meeting. They will be saved when the Lord Jesus Christ visibly, physically appears to them and they look upon him whom they have pierced, Zechariah. And when they do that, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna save them. They're going to accept him as the Messiah. He's going to sit down in Jerusalem to reign for a thousand years. And on this earth will be saviors, as it calls them in the book of Joel. Saviors, that's what they call us. They'll call us saviors. Not the Savior. There's just one Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a son of God, but I'm not the son of God. So on this earth during that thousand year period of time, we will be, we will be anointed with a glorified body. And like Michael, like Gabriel, like the archangels. If you remember in the Old Testament when, when uh, Joshua was right outside of Jericho, do you remember that story out there when he... He went outside of Jericho and he was getting ready. They were going to they were going to uh, attack the city. What did he run into? He did. He did. And you know something? I've preached that for for nearly forty years, and never really thought about it until the other day. Now that's an angel. That's an angel. There's no question about that. He said, "As the captain of the host of the Lord, am I come? And I take your shoes off the ground you stand on the holy ground." But you know who that was? That's Michael. That was Michael. Because Israel was going to war. They were going to war against their enemies. Their enemies were in, in, in the land of Israel. At that time they called it, uh, you know, the uh, Canaanites. But Michael, it says in the book of Daniel, chapter number 12, is the one who fights for the children of Israel. He stands for them. He stands for Israel. A lot of people mis misunderstand and misrepresent Michael and try to say that he is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not. Michael is a creature. He's an archangel. But he's still a creature. He was created. The Lord Jesus Christ, folks, is the creator. There is as much distance between the highest created beings, which would be cherubim, seraphim, archangels, and the rest of them, there still is as much distance between the Creator, that almighty eternal being, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, as there is from the most distant star and a piece of dirt on the ground. There's still a vast difference between the two. Michael is a creature. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Creator. Michael serves the Lord Jesus Christ, bows to Him, confesses that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father and worships him. Amen. So does Gabriel. 
So do the cherubim. So do the seraphim. So do the angels by their millions upon millions. And so do I. And so do you. And so will all. One day, when the Son of Man is revealed in all of His glory, in His power and His might, the Lamb of God that bore away the sin of the world is now the glorified, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Every creature that has ever drawn a breath of life will confess that He's Lord to the glory of God the Father. That day is going to come. And there's nothing that can be done about it. You can call yourself an agnostic, atheist, whatever you want, whatever. You're a Buddhist, a, a Hindu, a shaman, a Confucius, or whatever you want to call yourself. But the bottom line is that one day you will confess Amen. that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when you confess him to be Lord, you're not confessing so much the, simple, the fact that he's Savior. He certainly is that. You're confessing his ownership of everything, that he is the sovereign of creation, that he's the Lord over all creation. That's what you're confessing. When you confess that he's Lord, you're confessing there is none higher than the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, in thy name we pray that you'd use what I've said tonight for the glory of God. Thank you, Lord, for reaching into the dunghill and pulling me up and set my feet on a solid rock. You've established my goings forth. You've put the sweet Holy Spirit in me. You've birthed me into the family of God. By the new birth tonight, I am a son of God. What manner of love you have bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. And the day will come, Lord. There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that we'll see you as you are. What a privilege that is. Be merciful to us tonight. Let your precious blood cleanse our heart and our soul. God, forgive us. Cleanse me and forgive me. and Have mercy upon me, Lord. Be merciful to me, a sinner. In Jesus' sweet holy name we pray. And for Jesus' sake we ask it. And amen. All right, we got some.